The goal of Graylog and inputs. Graylog, as the name suggests, is a log management platform. And in order to manage logs, we need to get logs inside of Graylog somehow. In order to do that, we use inputs. You can configure new inputs or view existing inputs by going to system and inputs. By default, we don't have anything. We need to add at least one input to start getting data. You can select the input type from the drop-down list and then select launch new input. Now, I haven't gone and used all these inputs, and I believe there's even more in the commercial version of Graylog, but they're all trying to do one thing. Break the message they receive on that input into as many key value pairs as possible. So take this example message. This is a login message that Graylog received on an input. Your goal as a Graylog administrator is to break this message down into as many key value pairs as possible. When you see this message, what you really should be seeing is this table. We are taking the message and splitting it into separate key value pairs. The more key value pairs you have, the more granular you can get with dashboards, searching, alerting, really everything. In fact, this is how OpenSearch stores data. Instead of a traditional database with rows and columns, OpenSearch stores data in documents that contain keys and values. Now, some of these inputs break the message into key value pairs better than others, and we'll be looking at three different inputs today. But you should be aware that Graylog sets a couple key value pairs by default on every input, no matter what you receive. And that's because Graylog itself can determine what the value should be. Graylog knows when this message came in, so it can put a timestamp in the message. We can set the entire message itself to a key value pair. Remember what I said about OpenSearch? This is how it stores data as key value pairs. So we need to create a key to store the entire message. So we create a key called message and the value is the entire message we received. I should note on the syslog input, the message will actually be stripped of the standard syslog compliant keys. So the message you have here is not going to contain the actual real message. You need to check store full message on the settings of the syslog input to store the entire message you receive unaltered in a new key called full message. In my experience, all the other inputs, you will actually see the entire unaltered message in the message key. Now that we know what our goal is, let's look at some inputs. Okay, let's talk about the big guy in the room first, the one that just about every IT professional has heard of, syslog. Now, when I create a new syslog input, I'm telling Graylog the messages I receive on this syslog input will indeed be syslog compliant messages. And that's one of the issues with syslog is that some vendors didn't follow the rules exactly. So they might say I'm sending a compliant syslog message, but when you go to view it in Graylog, it's not really extracting the key value pairs correctly. And looking into it further, you say, yeah, this is not really a syslog message. If that was the case, you might not even want to use this input. You might want to use the next input we're going to talk about. But if they are sending a compliant syslog message, it's not that bad. The syslog input will extract some key value pairs from this message. And it can do that because they're in the proper location for a syslog message. Now the RFC 5424 standard does say syslog message can contain additional key value pairs, but in my experience, I haven't seen a lot of vendors do this. So for the actual message, this part, we still need to break that up later. So if you're receiving a non-compliant syslog message, or maybe your vendor got really creative and decided to write an entirely new logging format that no one's ever heard of, we still have a solution because we can create a raw plain text input. When I create a new input of this type in Graylog, it's going to listen on a port of my choosing. Let's say 5555 in this case. When any TCP data it's the IP address of my gray log server on that port, I'm going to log it. It doesn't care about message format. It doesn't care what the data is. So that message that wasn't compliant, yes, it will log it. That device you bought on Alibaba, yes, it will log it. And let me prove my point. If I put the IP address of my gray log server in my web browser and use port 5555, when I hit enter, my web browser is going to make an HTTP GET request to that IP address and port number. 
So if I'm sending data and great log is listening for data, I should see a log message when I hit return. And there you go. It doesn't really matter what I send, great log was going to log it anyway. Now, some of you out there might have said, wait a second, why do you have so many messages? An HTTP GET request with all its headers should really be maybe one packet. Why is it splitting every single header into its own message? Well, I had the same question. And at first I thought I had stumbled upon some hidden HTTP header farcer, but that seemed just a little ridiculous. So I did a packet capture and we are only receiving one packet on this interface. And when I looked at the headers, it was pretty obvious what was going on. Each header has a new line character at the end. So when I go to create a raw plain text input, there is a checkbox, null frame delimiter. When the null frame delimiter is not checked, it will scan the message for any new line characters. If it sees one, it's going to split it into a separate message. To see the entire TCP frame as one log message, check this box. Now we see we can input pretty much anything via the raw plain text input. Now the downside to this is it doesn't really break the message into key value pairs. If we open the message up, we can see we only have the default key value pairs. So while raw plain text input can accept anything, it's also the most amount of work. So the last input I want to talk about here is GELF. Greylog extended logging format. Greylog made this logging format with the concept of key value pair in mind. So when I receive a GELF message on an input, the entire message is already split into key value pairs. So my work is really done. I can go straight into creating dashboards and nice graphs and tables. This is the format I personally use when I'm doing any logging in Python. Now, there's some other inputs on here, such as CEF, common event format. That is another big one that splits the message into key value pairs. And really, all these inputs are going to fall somewhere in between these three at how good it is at extracting key value pairs. And at the end of the day, you're going to be stuck using whatever input the vendor is outputting. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about really doesn't have anything to do with Greylog. It has to deal with Ubuntu. And this problem... I think I spent an hour on it the first time I was playing with Greylog. I just didn't know this. Uh, so TCP and UDP ports below 1024 are privileged. So you need special rights to access them. And Greylog doesn't have that by default. So the best way I found uh, is this, uh, is that you just edit the systemd service to add the capabilities to use those ports. If you don't add this line in your uh, systemd service config, then it won't start. If you try to use a port below 1024, it won't start in Greylog. It'll give you like a permission error. So one way is just use ports above that and you never have this issue. But the issue with that is that some vendors hard code the port in their syslog and logging in general. So you can't use custom ports. So if you're stuck with that, you're going to have to do something like this. There's also another thing where you can like NAT, uh, NAT forward the port to another port. And I did that in the past. This is a much better solution in my opinion. So this is what I would recommend. Okay, that just about does it for this video. Extractors are up next. Thank you again for watching.